Chapter 11. Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag. Alfie took an early train to the hospital, stepping into King's Cross Station just after 10 o'clock in the morning. It was a Monday, and normally he would have been in school on a Monday, which was history day, but he had different plans for this Monday, the day he was planning on saving his father's life by breaking him out of hospital. Carrying a duffel bag over his shoulder, he bought one return ticket from London to Ipswich and another single from Ipswich to London. Georgie wouldn't be going back there after all. This time, he found his platform without difficulty and settled into the corner of a carriage, talking to no one and trying to lose himself in Robinson Crusoe. Arriving close to where he and Marion had alighted the previous week, he looked around, wondering whether anybody else might be getting off here. And when it seemed as if he were the only one, he began to worry that the train wouldn't stop at all. But a few minutes later, to his relief, he felt the engines beginning to slow down and the train screeched to a halt as he hopped off, making his way down the narrow lane towards the crossroads and along the path that led to the East Suffolk and Ipswich Hospital. Outside the main gate, he waited for a few minutes, making sure that no one else was going to appear and want to know what he was doing there. He ran behind a tree to take care of some personal business and then, feeling that now was as good a time as any, sprinted up the driveway as fast as his legs could carry him. Through the front doors of the hospital, a dog appeared and growled at him, and Alfie stopped dead. He was a bit afraid of dogs. He had been ever since he'd been three, and Jack Tamarin from Number 20's Terrier had snapped at his hand while he was trying to feed it a bone. He watched, waiting to see what happened, but the dog seemed to lose interest in him, and finally trotted back indoors and out of sight. Who would bring a dog into a hospital? wondered Alfie. It didn't seem very hygienic. A window opened behind him and he pressed himself against the wall as a young woman's head leaned out and looked down the drive. He was so close to her that he could have reached up and touched her, but she didn't glance down under the windowsill, just out towards the gates. There's no one there, Bessie, she said, turning back. You're seeing things you are. You've gone by me. You need your Henry back. That's what you need. A chance would be a fine thing, replied an unseen person from inside. He was somewhere outside Antwerp last I heard. I'll be lucky if I see him again this side of Christmas. He'll be all over by Christmas, said the first girl, closing the window again. And whatever the response was to that, Alfie didn't hear. But he hoped it was suitably unimpressed. He slipped round the corner of the building and down the path towards the gap in the hedge where the patients had been sitting outside in the sunshine the previous week, hoping that the young man with the lank, dark hair had grabbed his arm wouldn't be there. But this part of the garden was empty today. All the men must be indoors. The table that had held the newspapers and apples was still there. A black bird perched on top of it, its head darting around as it scanned the tabletop for crumbs. Alfie stepped out into the clearing beyond and discovered two men sitting in their bath chairs, wrapped in heavy coats and with rugs across their knees. They looked perfectly peaceful, but were not speaking to each other. The second man had his back turned, like Georgie had the previous week so Alfie couldn't make out his face. Hello there, said the man closest to him, putting his butt down on his lap and taking his spectacles off. And who might you be? Alfie looked at him and hesitated. He didn't want to get into any conversations with the men today, but thought it best not to antagonise anyone in case they call for a doctor or nurse. Alfie Summerfield, he said. I had a brother called Alfie, said the man, smiling at him. His number got called at Ypres. Damn difficult word to say, Ypres, don't you think? It took me a long time to get it right. Yes, sir, said Alfie, stepping past him to make his way down to the man at the end. Don't go, said the man. And something in his voice, something pleading, made Alfie stop and look at him. He wasn't really that old, no more than 25. He didn't look like he'd suffered any injuries and seemed to have recently had a wash as he smelled of soap and his hair was fluffy. What are you doing here anyway? We don't get many boys your age round here. None at all, in fact. I'm looking for my dad, said Alfie. Is he a doctor? Alfie was about to say no, that, that he was a patient, but thought better of it. Yes, he said. I, I thought he might be out here. We only see the doctors indoors, said the man. The nurses come and look after us here. Good thing too. They're a far prettier lot. But tell me, where were you? Alfie stared at him, uncertain what the question meant. Where was I? he asked. Yes, where were you? France or Belgium? Alfie frowned. Neither, 
he said. The man leaned forward and frowned. You're not a country, are you? No, sir. Oh, all right then, he said with a sigh, leaning back. It hurts, doesn't it? What does? asked Alfie. Don't you hear it in your head? I do. Although it's peaceful in the garden, I asked them to bring me out here regardless of the weather. Can't stand it inside. All that wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's positively biblical at times. As if on cue, there was a loud bang from the house, something like a door slamming as the wind rushed through a hallway. Alfie spun round in that direction, and when he looked back at the man, his eyes were closed, and he seemed to be counting slowly in his head. Dr Ridgewell tells me to do this, he said after a moment, opening his eyes and attempting a smile. I'm quite all right, really. I'm being sent home on Monday. What day is it today? Monday, said Alfie. Oh, replied the man, considering this. Then they must have got it wrong. It's a difficult word to say, isn't it? Ypres. But then, that's the French for you. They don't like to make things easy. I knew a girl in Paris, you know. Fine little thing. Worked in a bistro off the Avenue de la Mopique. Thought about Marina. But I know what my father would have said if I brought her home. Can't stand the Continentals, you see. And he has money, so he assumes everyone wants some of it. Never cared for money much myself. Easy to say, I suppose, when you have a lot of it. Alfie looked towards the man at the end of the garden and, as if he felt the boy's eyes on him, he turned round. It wasn't his dad. I have to go, said Alfie. How funny rounds, are you? You're young for a doctor, but I suppose we must all chip in at these times. <laughs> Alfie nodded and stepped away. He hated it here. He hated this place and he hated these people. Being at this hospital was like stepping into the middle of a nightmare where nothing anyone said made any sense. The men were all confused, living partly in the present, partly in the past, and partly in some no man's land that they marched across, trying to dodge bullets and failing, flailing, falling. He was doing the right thing getting his dad away from here, he was sure of it. He picked up the duffel bag and made his way through the hedge and over towards the hospital. He stood outside now, dreading the idea of going back inside, but there was no way around it. He had hoped that he would discover Georgie out in the grounds and that they could make their escape together, but this hadn't happened and he would have to go in search of him. In one of those terrible wards. He threw the duffel bag behind a potted plant and opened the door, poking his head inside. The coast was clear. There was a staircase halfway down the corridor and he looked up. It was at least three stories high, with rooms on the perimeter of each floor. Oh, his heart sank, wondering how on earth he would ever find his dad in so large a place. In front of him was the nurse's station, where he had been discovered the last time, and he walked quickly towards it, pleased to see that there was no one there now. If the angry doctor found him again, he'd never believe his story about being the milkman's son. He looked around, stepped behind the desk, and as he did so, he saw Dr Ridgewell, whose shoes he had shined twice now, emerging from one of the wards with another doctor, younger and nervous looking, and he slipped down behind the counter, hoping that they wouldn't come round to this side. Could go out early next week, I think, Dr Ridgewell was saying. Book him in for some appointments with Davis in Harley Street. I've spoken to his secretary, she knows all about it. Once a week should be enough. It's encouraging though, isn't it, to see someone improve so much. It gives one hope for the others. Have you heard anything from the water office yet, Doctor? said the younger man. About what? Recognition. There was a silence for a few moments. Not yet, now. None of these bloody politicians wants to be the one to actually state the obvious, to make it clear to the public that this condition is real and that it's something we all have to deal with. We'll be dealing with it for years to come, I'm afraid. The problem is, the public still think of it as cowardice and no one in Parliament has the guts to tell them otherwise. I thought, said the young man, that is to say, I was wondering whether... Ah, oh, spit it out, chart. Well, I don't have all day. Well, it's just that we've had some successes, haven't we? And some failures. Would it be helpful to invite some gentlemen of the press here? They could write about it. Put it in about with a bit of general population. Put it about a bit with the general population. Ah, oh, we might get a little more public support that way. Dr Ridgewell didn't say anything for a few moments. And when he did, his tone suggested that he was astounded by the very idea. Gentlemen of the press, he asked, slowly enunciating every word. Have you quite lost your reason, Charwell? Invite the newspapers here to the East Suffolk 
Do you really think that's what our patients need? Allow the gawking journalists interviewing them and taking pictures of them to sell papers? Ugh, I only meant that if we could tell the world what's going on here, then we might encourage them to speak to their local members of parliament. We could show them people like Boyers, since he's going home practically mended. We could tell them about the good work we're doing. And what about those who aren't getting any better Chartwell? Have you thought about them? Levinson, on the first floor. Hobbs, in the ward next to him. Summerfield, on the second. Shall we wheel them out too and make a spectacle of them to the world and its mother? Am I to become P.T. Barnum and these unfortunate men my circus freaks? Half his ears pricked up when he heard his own surname being mentioned. Summerfield on the second. Oh, I'm sorry, Doctor, said the young man, a note of contrition in his tone now. It was a bad idea. It would have to be a considerably better idea, Chartwell, to qualify as a bad idea. It would have many degrees of stupidity to get through before it could aspire to such an elevated term. And now, let's just get on with what we do best, the practice of medicine, and leave the outside world to think about what they will think. Now, I can't stand around here all day chinwagging. I have patience to see, and I'm sure that you do too. And to Alfie's relief, they started to walk away and never noticed him hiding there. He jumped out from behind the counter and began climbing the stone stairs, reaching the landing of the first floor and continuing up to the second. At least he knew his father's floor now. There was the murmur of low voices here, patients in their rooms, nurses tending to him. And he tiptoed quietly along, looking into the first ward, trying to stay quiet so that no one would notice him. It was difficult to identify his father though, for so many of the men were either curled up in their beds with the blankets pulled up to their faces, or sitting in chairs with their backs to him, staring out of the window. His heart sank, and he didn't know what to do. But that was when he saw him, in a ward with the words St Margaret's written above the door, seated by the window, shuffling a pack of cards, pulling different ones out at random, and staring at them for a few moments before putting them back in. Alfie stepped inside and looked around. There were three other men in the ward. The first was lying in the bed to Alfie's left and was fast asleep. A blanket pulled up to his chin while his hands gripped it like a small child. Opposite him was another man sitting up and reading a book. He put it down when he saw Alfie and started grinning. He didn't have any teeth. Alfie raised a hand and held it in the air for a moment and the man shook his head and looked away. In the third bed was a very young man. He didn't look more than about 18, lying down with his hands clenched into fists, which he held at the side of his head. Every few seconds, his eyes would close tightly and he would emit a strange sound, like a gasp of horror. Then the moment would pass and his fists would unclench again before it all began once more. And finally, there, by the window, was Georgie Summerfield. Dad, said Alfie, reaching him and kneeling down before him. Dad, it's me, Alfie. Georgie stared at him, and the signs of recognition appeared on his face. He already seemed better than he had last week. Alfie, he said, it's never you. It is, said Alfie. I told you I'd come back. When did you tell me, Alfie? I'm not dreaming this, am I? Come here to me, son. Alfie moved forward, and Georgie put both hands out to touch Alfie's face. His fingers moved across his cheeks and chin, the way a blind man's might if he wanted to find out something about you. It is you, isn't it? He said in a quiet voice, amazement mixed with emotion. But well, you've grown so big. You're not five anymore, are you? I'm nine, said Alfie, confused, for his father had seen him only a few days early, but seemed to have completely forgotten about it. He glanced at the bedside locker, where three different coloured pills were laid out on a tin plate beside a glass of water, and he wondered how much medicine they were giving Georgie every day, and whether it was making him forget things. Nine, said his dad, shaking his head in wonder. You're not here now too, are you? he asked suddenly, an expression of horror crossing his face before he shook his head. No, of course you're not. I'm not thinking straight. You're just a boy. You couldn't be. But then, what are you doing here? Who let you in? I've come for you, Dad, said Alfie. For me? To take you home. Georgie swallowed and shook his head. I can't go home, he said. I'm not well, Alfie. You're not well because this place is making you not well. But if you come home with me, I'll make you better. I promise, you need to get back on the milk float. Mr Asquith is still there, you know. He misses you something rotten. Who? Mr Asquith, 
repeated Alfie. You know, Mr Asquith. Oh, yes, said Georgie, shaking his head slowly as if he had no idea what Alfie was talking about. I can come to work with you, said Alfie. You said I could when I was older. If I was too young for the floats, your mother would have my guts for garters. But I'm nine now, Dad, nine. A sound came from the boy in the bed opposite and Alfie looked across at him. His eyes were open, but they didn't seem to be focused on anything. He's barely said anything sensible in a week, poor blighter, said Georgie, shaking his head. His mind's done for. Dad, you have to come with me, said Alfie, tugging at his father's hand. We can leave, both of us. There's a train. I've got two tickets. I'll take you home. You'll get better if you just come home. All right, Alfie, said Georgie, shrugging his shoulders as if he didn't have any choice in the matter. Dr Ridgewell said it's all right, did he? Alfie hesitated, but then nodded quickly. Yeah, he replied. He says you're better, and all you need is to go home to your family. He told me to come and get you. You never said anything to me about it. Oh, he cried suddenly, grimacing and putting a hand to his temple. Pills, pills, he grunted, pointing at the dish beside the bed, and Alfie ran over to get them and the glass of water. Georgie swallowed each one quickly and sat back in his chair, breathing heavily as if this had already exhausted him. It's the headaches, he said quietly. I get them every so often. Rotten things they are. Pain like you wouldn't believe. They make me sick. I need my pills, Alfie. They give me them every three hours. Don't let's go without them. It's fine, Dad, said Alfie, who knew there was a medicine cabinet in the bathroom at home next to the bandages, a gloopy green bottle for when he had a cough, and a couple of bottles of pills. He didn't know what for. We've got lots of pills at home. You, you can have some of those. Oh, all right then, Alfie, said Georgie, shrugging his shoulders again. And it was only now that Alfie realised that his dad wasn't behaving like his dad anymore. It was as if they'd swapped roles and Georgie simply believed whatever Alfie told him, as if he was the adult and Georgie the child. This idea made Alfie feel very uncomfortable and even a little frightened. His dad was supposed to take care of him, not the other way around. Come on then, he said, pulling his father up again and leading the way out of the ward. We need to go downstairs quietly. Bye, lads, said Georgie cheerfully, waving at the men in the beds, but his voice was too loud and Alfie shushed him. They made their way to the ground floor without anybody noticing them and out into the courtyard where Alfie retrieved his duffel bag. He opened it up and pulled out the trousers, shirt and jacket that he'd taken from his dad's wardrobe that morning. Put these on, said Alfie. That way, no one will grow suspicious on the train. All right, Alfie said Georgie, obediently putting the clothes on over his pyjamas and then slipping on the shoes that Alfie handed him. You are sure about this though, aren't you? Dr Ridgewell says it's fine. He told me to come and get you, said Alfie. Come on, Dad, let's go. As they turned the corner, Alfie saw a man marching towards them wearing a full dress uniform and he felt his heart jump in his chest. The man was staring at the two of them and picking up his pace as he got closer. Don't say anything, Dad, whispered Alfie. Leave this to me, all right? All right, Alfie, said Georgie. You boy, said the man, stopping now before them. He had very red cheeks and a snow white moustache and was carrying something resembling a cane in his hands. Where am I? Uh, the East Suffolk and Ipswich Hospital, said Alfie. Yes, I know that, said the man irritably. I'm not completely stupid, you know. I'm looking for the entrance to Bewing. There's a bloody great dog down there at the main doors, and every time I try to go in, he growls at me. I would have shot him, but I left my gun at GHQ. Alfie stared at him in horror. For a moment, he wondered whether this was just another one of the patients, but the man's uniform said otherwise. Who are you, anyway? asked the man. What's a boy doing here? And who's this fellow? Georgie Summerfield, said Georgie, smiling as if the whole thing was a terrific joke. I had a dog myself when I was a boy. A little King Charles, melancholy little fellow, but full of love. Hmm, fascinating, said the man. Work here, do you, Georgie? Doctor Summerfield, said Alfie quickly. Oh, said the man, looking him up and down and backing off a little. You're in charge around here, are you? Not me, sir, no, said Georgie. Doctor Summerfield is just leaving for the day, said Alfie. At this time, asked the man, checking his watch. Bit early to down tools, isn't it? Uh, he was on the night shift, said Alfie. And what are you, the ventriloquist dummy? Can't Dr Summerfield speak for himself? Who are you, anyway? His father is a patient here, said Georgie, standing up straight now and speaking in a clear voice. And how's he doing? Not well. We came to see him, but we can't have boys here. I'm making sure he gets back to the station on my way out. 
Hmm, said the man. Very well. Give him a clip round the ear, did you? No, sir, said Georgie. Oh, I would have. Can't abide boys near. Or girls. Any children, really. Either gender. I don't discriminate. Hate them both equally. Well, look. Bewing. Help me out, will you? Go through this door, said Alfie. Then walk down the corridor. Take the first left and you'll come to a staircase. Go up one flight and turn right until you reach St Hilda's Ward. Then go through the door that says no entry. And the long corridor there will lead you to Bewing. Mm, thank you, said the man, nodding cheerfully now. Think I got all that? You're welcome, said Alfie, who'd made every word of that last speech up. But he simply wanted the man to leave and hopefully to get lost in the corridors of the East Suffolk. You did brilliant, Dad, said Alfie, when the man was gone. But Georgie had relapsed into his former absent state now, and it took him a long time to turn his head. What was that, Alfie? You were just like your old self. He didn't suspect a thing. Georgie said nothing, simply frowned and then closed his eyes as he let a low groan emerge from his mouth and pressed his hands to his temples. Dad, said Alfie. Dad, are you all right? Fine, son, said Georgie quietly. Can we go back inside now? I think I should get back to my bed. No, I'm taking you home, remember? Oh, oh yes, he replied. All right, then, if that's what you think is best. Halfway down the drive, Alfie saw three nurses coming up it and he pushed his father behind a group of trees. What's going on? asked Georgie, looking around as if he'd just been woken up. Shh, said Alfie, don't make a sound. Sergeant Clayton on the prowl, is he? Dad, shh, insisted Alfie, watching the nurses as they passed. I was only asking, Dad! Alfie felt himself breaking out into a sweat. All it would take was for one of the nurses to turn her head and she would surely see them hiding in the greenery. He held his breath and only exhaled again after they had passed by. Right, he said, come on, we need to get out of here as fast as we can. He broke into a run and Georgie watched him in confusion for a moment before running after him. When they were clear of the hospital gates, they stopped and caught their breath. The train station's down here, said Alfie, just follow me. Alfie, said Georgie as they sat down on the grass a few minutes later, waiting for the train to arrive. You did remember my pills, didn't you? Told you, said Alfie. There's plenty of pills at home. You can have some of those. But you won't need them, I promise. Once you're back home in Damley Road, you'll be right as rain. All right, Alfie, said Georgie, nodding his head satisfied. All right, Dad, said Alfie.